Good morning, everyone. To begin this morning at SciTech, please welcome Taylor Fazzini to the stage. Good morning, and welcome to the third day of the 2024 AIAA SciTech Forum. I'm Taylor Fazzini, a Principal Systems Test Engineer at Northrop Grumman Aeronautic Systems. And it's my pleasure to serve again this year on the SciTech Guiding Coalition. I'd like to start with a warm welcome to our AIAA corporate members. Corporate membership in AIAA enables organizations to expand their industry presence, improve workforce development, get involved with advocacy, and participate in purposeful collaboration. We're thrilled that 62 of our nearly 100 corporate members are participating here this week as speakers, sponsors, and exhibitors. We encourage everyone who is part of a corporate member organization to take advantage of the expanded corporate member zone to relax and recharge during the week. To begin our morning, we will celebrate four Propulsion and Energy Award recipients. I would like to invite Rusty Powell, the Propulsion and Energy Group Director, to the stage to help present these awards. It's my pleasure to begin by announcing the 2024 AIAA Air Breathing Propulsion Award for sustained meritorious accomplishment in the arts, sciences, and technology of air breathing propulsion systems. The 2024 AIAA Air Breathing Propulsion Award is presented to Aspia Wadia, GE Aviation. The award citation reads, for sustained excellence, global impact, and revolutionary research and development in gas turbine aerodynamics. Congratulations. We are also pleased to present the 2024 AIAA Propellants and Combustion Award for outstanding technical contributions to aeronautical or astronautical combustion engineering to Jeffrey Cohen of the RTX Corporation. The award citation reads, for outstanding contributions to sprays, combustion control, and gas turbine combustion. Congratulations. Next, it's my pleasure to announce the 2024 AIAA Wild Propulsion Award for outstanding achievement in the development or application of rocket propulsion systems to Joseph Majdalani, Auburn University. The award citation reads, for groundbreaking theoretical modeling and research on cyclonic rocket engines, revolutionizing the understanding of these and many other liquid, solid, and hybrid rocket engines. Congratulations, Joseph. <laughs> Lastly, I am pleased to announce the 2024 AIAA Energy Systems Award. This award is presented for a significant contribution in the broad field of energy systems specifically as related to the application of engineering sciences and systems engineering to the production, storage, distribution, and conservation of energy. The 2024 AIAA Energy Systems Award is presented to Jackie chi Jun Sung, University of Connecticut. The award citation reads, for outstanding contributions to flame dynamics and low temperature chemistry, for developing fuel-flexible, ultra-low emission, efficient combustion energy systems using conventional and alternative fuels. Jackie is unable to join us in person today, but we send our congratulations on this award. Please join me in congratulating all of our award winners this morning. One of the highlights of the SciTech Forum is when we recognize our newest AIAA Associate Fellows. This distinguished group of professionals has been selected by their peers for their significant and lasting contributions to the aerospace profession. They exemplify expertise, passion, and dedication to advancing their specific disciplines, and they are truly shaping the future of aerospace. 
Tonight, we will celebrate them during the dinner and induction ceremony. But now, I would like to ask the class of 2024 AIAA Associate Fellows to stand and be recognized. And please join me in a round of applause for these outstanding individuals. <laughs> Turning now to our program, today's high-level programming will focus on emerging capabilities and challenges in test. I have to say, as a test engineer, I am absolutely thrilled that we're spending a full day discussing this absolutely crucial part of aerospace design. We'll kick off this morning with a keynote address from Jennifer Uchida. Jen is the president of the Society of Flight Test Engineers, and she has quite a storied career in test. She was a civilian flight test engineer for the Marine Corps, supporting experimental flight testing of the V-22 Osprey, working on life-saving capabilities and logging more than 100 hours of crew time. She is also a graduate of the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, was one of the top 50 candidates for the selection to NASA's astronaut program in 2013. She's worked on the G500 and G600 type certification for Gulfstream Aerospace, and has also managed test and evaluation at Aerotech. Now, Jen is the Senior Test Program Manager for Product Development at Boeing Test and Evaluation, where she leads the planning and execution of all BCA product development test work statements for lab and flight test. In addition to her role as the president of the Society of Flight Test Engineers, she also volunteers as an executive mentor for the Brooke Owens Fellowship and serves on the external advisory board for the University of Colorado Aerospace Department. She's also a ski instructor, so maybe we'll hear about that as well. Jen is the perfect person to kick off today's session focusing on test and evaluation, and when she finishes her remarks, she'll take your questions. Please use the QR code that's been coming up on the screen this week in order to ask or upvote a question. And now, please join me in welcoming Jen Uchida to the stage. Thank you, Taylor. Um, you know, Flight Test is such an amazing community. Uh, Taylor and I have actually crossed paths a couple times in our careers, both at very different points in our careers um, and also in our personal lives. The first time we met, uh, she was a young co-op at Gulfstream Aerospace. Um, I was a lead flight test engineer and also pregnant with my first child. And as I was creating this keynote, uh, it dawned on me, Taylor, that that baby is now seven years old. And it doesn't, feel, it doesn't feel like that much time has passed, but I think that is a great example of how, um, how amazing Flight Test is because we still rely on the basic fundamentals of Flight Test that have been developed uh, decades ago. That, those fundamentals have transcended decades. Um, and I think that is a really cool, um, a really cool thing to note as I, as I open up this keynote. Um, Speaking of, de of decades, I want to take you back. 1969, the beginning of the Society of Flight Test Engineers. Um, it was a very different time back then, right? Uh, there weren't personal computers, uh, personal cell phone devices. Social media certainly wasn't around. So, um, you know, communication happened very differently. If you wanted to talk to somebody or call somebody, you actually picked up a landline to do that. Um, and, and flight test technology was no different, right? Um, oftentimes, um, quick look data was recorded by hand on clipboard with pencils and pens. Um, other data was recorded with photo recorders or magnetic tape. Uh, data post-processing uh, happened uh, via multi-step process that oftentimes took days to complete. Um, at that time, you know, the smallest computer was probably bigger than a truck, um, and students were making through engineering school using slide rules and pencils. So this is, this is where we are, 1969. The, the, actually, the idea for the Society of Flight Test Engineers, um, it, was, it, was, it happened in 1968. Um, a small group of uh, Boeing Seattle flight test engineers working on the first certification of the 737, they identified a need to collaborate and share and talk about lessons learned with fellow flight test engineers, not just within Boeing, but across the industry. 
It all started uh, with meetings once a week in the living room of member number two, John Whitworth, uh, a former Boeing flight test engineer. Um, this small group of FTEs, they created a constitution, bylaws, the basic framework for which our society operates today. In 1969, um, they had started to generate a lot of interest in the industry. They had set out to contact other companies that had flight test departments, um, generate interest in memberships. At that time, uh, membership was free, and uh, they had only asked for a mere $5 to help with uh, some of the administrative costs. Um, there was a ch talk between the uh, Long Island, a potential Long Island chapter, which was consisted mostly of Grumman flight test engineers um, to get together. Uh, they called it a management symposium. That was held in April of 1969. And it was considered a huge success as th at that point they decided, yes, we want to make this society official. The temporary board of directors was made official and the society in and of itself was, was conceived. Um, I wanna talk about the very first time that the impact of this society left its mark on the industry. Uh, it was in 1970, and it was the very first built uh, Grumman F-14 Tomcat. On its second flight, uh, the aircraft had an incident and crashed. Um, the Boeing flight test engineers in Seattle picked up the phone, called their Grumman counterparts in Long Island. They wanted to see what happened. They wanted to make sure everybody was okay. What the, the, what the Grumman engineers did know was that um, they had uh, two systems hydraulic failures and the remaining system couldn't handle the, the loads that, um, that the aircraft was exhibiting on, on final approach. Both pilots ejected, there were no injuries, everybody was okay. But it just so happened that two weeks before that, a Boeing 747 also had a two hydraulic system failure. Now, the 747 being as big as it is, um, had enough uh, remaining hydraulic systems to, to bring the air, aircraft back home. So it was really a non-event for the Boeing flight test engineers. So um, the Boeing FTEs thought this was interesting. They passed along some of the root cause that they found in that in their findings. Uh, other pertinent information was passed on to Grumman. And two days later, the Grumman flight test engineers called back to Seattle and said, that was it. Now it's hard to say but I think it's safe to say that the impact that that communication had on the F-14 program saved them a lot of time in troubleshooting and getting back to first flight. Excuse me, getting back to flight testing. Okay, fast forward to 2024. Lots, a lot's happened since then. Um, this is the 30th Board of Directors of the Society of Flight Test Engineer, of which I am very proud to be the first woman at the helm. Um, but our name actually is a little bit misleading. Yes, we started off as flight test engineers, but we also welcome uh, designers, engineering, analysis, pilots. We are a community, we are a society of flight testers, of flight test professionals. And this kind of diversity is really important to us um, because with this technical diversity also comes a wave of cultural and gender diversity that we believe is going to make us safer and more effective as flight testers and as a community. So what do we officially do? Why do we exist? What is our purpose? The Society of Flight Test Engineers is an international professional organization whose mission is to advance flight test safety, effectiveness, and efficiency. The Society is dedicated to sharing knowledge and fostering collaboration across the aerospace industry by promoting expertise and esteem among flight test professionals. Again, that word there, flight test professionals. Um, we're a global organization now, as you can see. This is a map of our membership aco across the globe. We have over 1,600 members now with uh, 20, chap 20 active chapters. We've come a long way since those weekly meetings in John Whitworth's living room in 1968. Okay, 
Here's an example of uh, some of the services that we offer our membership. So a couple years ago, we launched a brand new website um, that connects our membership on a global scale. Um, we house a lot of technical information in here, a lot of references, there are forums. Um, all of our technical, this is something we're really proud of, all of the technical papers that have uh, been presented at SFTE symposiums for the past 50 plus years are all in a database on our website, and it's all fully searchable. Um, every year we host a symposium. It's hosted uh, by a different chapter every year. We are still coming down off of a very high high uh, from last October where the Patuxent River chapter hosted the symposium in Annapolis, Maryland. We had a record number of paper submissions. We had a record number of registrations. Um, our symposium uh, are always hybrid, so we are offering, much like AIAA, we are offering in-person and a virtual aspect to that. Uh, we're, we're pretty proud of that. This year, um, the symposium is coming to my hometown. The Seattle chapter will be hosting the symposium this October, and uh, they have chosen the theme, This is Why We Test. We're also in the middle of a major um, historical archiving project. So we have taken boxes and boxes of historical documents and artifacts and we've digitized all of this. And we will be making all of this information um, and historical documents available to our membership as we, um, as we wor work through all of the massive amounts of data that, that we've now acquired. Okay, but we don't do this alone. Right, that's the whole point. Where our, our, our goal is to collaborate and make sure that communication is happening amongst the professionals in our industry. Um, we have created the Flight Test Safety Committee in partnership with the Society of Experimental Test Pilots and with AIAA. It was formed jointly in 1994, and the whole purpose is to create a community and a forum around flight test safety specifically, and to create that conduit of communication. Um, it's, uh, there's a flight test seminar, a safety seminar that happens every year, um, and a lot of great collaboration uh, comes out of that event as well. SETP, SFTE, and AIAA, we all collaborate uh, for local events as well, local symposiums. Most notably, I'd like to point out the Southwest Aerospace Symposium. They've been doing that for a while, um, and a lot of great information comes out of that symposium as well. And just last summer, we were invited by the AIAA Digital Avionics Technical Committee to take part in their STEM outreach event at EAA's Air Venture in Oshkosh, and that was a really cool event. Um, they had multiple stations uh, bringing students through. I think we brought over 200 students through that day. Um, SFTE, we had our own little room. We had a simulator. We talked about test planning. We talked about flying test points, gathering data, uh, crunching data, what we do with that data. Um, it was a really rewarding um, event, and we are really happy to have this partnership with the DATC portion of uh, AAAA. We also partner with the Vertical Flight Society, um, the eVTOL Flight Test Council, which is hosted by the Vertical Flight Society. Um, that is a council that is dedicated to all things eVTOL um, and cVTOL, conventional VTOL. Uh, it's basically exploring the uh, regulatory areas and the uh, handling qualities and the flight testing aspects of uh, advanced air mobility and um, electric aviation. Now, these are just a few examples of the collaboration that happens in our industry. Um, I could go on and on, but I won't. Um, but what I will ask is, why is this collaboration important? Why, why do we put all this effort into making sure that we have that outreach into other societies, into the, com into the companies, and into the, the various other departments that, uh, that connect with flight test? Um, I'm going to show you why. So the video I'm about to show you is from the, the flight deck of the first flight of the Magni X E Caravan, which flew its first flight in 2020. Now Magni X is a small company based out of Seattle, Washington, and they develop and, uh, and uh, build electric engines. 
Uh, they partnered with another small company based out of Seattle called Aerotech to do the integration of their Magni 500 into a Cessna caravan. Now this was a technology demonstrator program and the sole purpose was to prove that they could use their engine, their electric engine, as a drop-in replacement to the legacy PT6 engine. Um, overall, the program was a huge success. Lots of lessons learned from this um, that, that MagniX has since been able to implement into the design and integration of, of their future products. We'll go to that video, please. So here, uh, the throttle's coming up. You can see the aircraft is uh, starting its ground acceleration. Now I have them have the volume up because I want you to note just how quiet it is with that electric engine in there. We also had a safety chase for this flight, uh, and that aircraft was already up in the pattern at this point. All right, up at altitude. The uh, pilot performed a pitch authority check with both takeoff and landing flaps, and he found that there was good pitch authority throughout a simulated landing flare. So um, because of that, uh, the pilot decided that it was safe to come into the pattern for the planned full stop landing. And as the final flap selection is happening there, you can see there is a complete power loss. The whole aircraft uh, power system dropped out. No radios, no thrust. You can see the pilot here trying to troubleshoot. He's checking the radio there. You can also see that big screen there. It's starting to reboot. So uh, everybody's holding their breath, trying to see what happens with the system as, that, as it reboots there. Um, it's hard to tell, but the, the pilot did push in the throttle here. Um, there, was, there was no lag in thrust with throttle movement, so it was very clear from a, from a quick push of the throttle that there was no power there. Once the troubleshooting was over, the pilot switched focus to fly the pattern until he had the runway made. Um, you'll notice on short final here um, that the system did reboot, and uh, it was key that there was a green light above that red X. One of the inverters did reset. Now, that didn't mean that there was explicitly power still available. It just meant that the in one of the inverters in the system uh, was working. Now, from the outside, you can see the pilot's head moving around here, um, doing the troubleshooting before switching focus to the dead stick landing. Um, here he is trying to get on best glide speed. Now we flew this campaign out of the Grant County International Airport, which is based out of Moses Lake, Washington. They're a great airport to work with um, for experimental programs like this. So at this point, the pilot has the runway made. He is entering in a steady heading side slip to pull um, energy out of the aircraft. You can see the ARF fire truck right there waiting to support us. Um, also did a great job supporting us there. As he enters ground effect, he's taking out the side slip, lining up for the landing. You'll see our safety chase come out of the top there. Now, on the rollout, the pilot did once again test out that throttle um, response, um, and he found that he actually did have power on the aircraft. That inverter that had reset was able to provide about a quarter of the uh, total amount of power that, that would have been available to him. Um, so the, the buildup to this event was mainly focused on making sure that we would have an out, that every turn and every aspect of this flight, we would have an out. So the, uh, the flight plan was such that, you know, at any moment in that flight, we could get that aircraft on the ground with no power. That was, that was fully baked into our plan the whole time. Um, but what happened? So, so a few things happened here. During the pre-flight checks, um, the, the pilot was interrupted. Um, a, another a mechanic had to get in there to reset a few things. And so we were actually in a misconfiguration at takeoff for this first flight. Also, the power system was overloaded, which you could uh, see when the pilot went to actuate the flaps. It overloaded the system, completely shut down everything. Um, but like you saw in the video, the system was able to reset and we were able to get one of the four inverters back online. So why didn't this result in something worse? Why didn't the, this power outage perpetuate into an incident, into something that you would read in the news? Um, it's because of lessons learned from previous programs. While we were planning for this campaign, we made sure that we dug through the archives of the Society of Flight Test Engineers papers, the Society Experimental 
test pilots papers to figure out uh, for similar programs to see what might be applicable to our program. Due to the weight of the batteries, uh, the gross weight CG, uh, we were well outside of the um, certified envelope, as you can see on this, on this chart here. Um, and, and so what were we gonna do with that? Uh, we found a Cessna caravan in the Pacific Northwest that had an STC to go above and beyond the certified gross weight CG envelope. So uh, we rented that aircraft, we loaded it up, the pilot and a flight test engineer took it out uh, and just beat up the pattern. Uh, I think they got somewhere close to 20 full stop simulated no power landings. Um, so at that point, the pilot was very familiar with the handling qualities at that configuration. He had developed in his mind a process and procedures, his own special checklist that we could make sure um, was available during flight in the event of a power outage. On the product side, uh, Magniex has incorporated all of these lessons learned into their future products um, and specifically into the integration of their products into existing airframes. The principal takeaways from, flight, from a flight test perspective are maintain configuration control. Um, if you have a checklist interrupted, make sure that you start that over once you get back into, into the seat. Um, from an engineering standpoint, detailed failure mode analyses and testing is crucial here. Um, and making sure that uh, you design a fail safe and single fault tolerance system so that, it, um, so that you can uh, make sure that these kinds of things don't perpetuate into an incident. So the, the paper that is associated with this video and this actual chart here, um, it goes into a lot more detail on the program, on the design, on, um, on what happened, uh, the, the things that happened in advance to the power outage. Um, and uh, that is a whole nother 25 minutes. So we'll, <laughs> we'll move on here. So far, the aviation industry has been able to successfully massively successfully handle all of the new and novel technology that is coming our way. Um, you can throw anything at the fundamentals of flight test right now, uh, electric aviation, hydrogen aviation, um, and, and we're doing a pretty good job of making sure that we keep our flight testers safe and that we can keep the technology development rolling. But what's next? How do we make sure that we stay on top of safety and we, we remain effective in this space. During the, the uh, golden age of aviation, a lot of people got hurt. A lot of people died trying to get us to flight. Um, now, we've come a long way since then with technology and, and safety measures and processes, um, but, but that's something that we carry to this day. We want to make sure that the lessons learned previously in other flight test programs and other aviation uh, programs are implemented in the, in the future of flight test. With all these new startups um, around electric aviation, advanced air mobility, um, it's important that we are able to draw in um, all these companies and, uh, and most importantly, the people. Right? all the flight testers, so that we can share all of these ideas and make sure that we keep our people safe. Okay, I'd like to highlight a few papers that uh, give an example of um, how we as a flight test community are trying to uh, stay on top of the ever-evolving um, uh, in industry and, and workspace that we're living in now. The first one is titled, STPA Applied to a Neural Network Controlled Aircraft. So first of all, what is STPA? System Theor Theoretic Process Analysis. This is a relatively new um, hazard analysis technique, and it's based on an extended model of aircraft causation. Uh, in addition to component failures, STPA assumes that the interaction of systems can cause uh, hazards and failures, even if those components and systems haven't themselves failed. This paper investigates the safety implications of flight testing an uncrewed air vehicle controlled by a neural network-based flight autonomy software and the utility of STPA in identifying the risks 
of that kind of complex system. So the UAV in this case study involves a, uh, a various control regimes and handovers. So um, remotely piloted by a human being, um, a basic autopilot system, and then an AI software as well. From an operational environment, the UAV uh, was also working in both civil and restricted airspace, and there was also a, a chase, a crewed chase aircraft uh, to make sure that there was uh, a safety measure uh, involved in that. So STPA was uh, implemented after a traditional hazard assessment, but before the actual flight test portion. And what they found was that STPA was actually able to identify new hazards that hadn't been documented previously. The next one is causal analysis based on system theory or CAST to, flight to a flight test mishap investigation. Um, CAST is a modern systems engineering approach to investigating mishaps and incidences. It looks for reasons why the system and procedures and all the safety measures that we've put in place fail. Now, for this case study, the author used a flight test incident um, from a B-1A bomber that happened in 1984. Now, the actual effectiveness of CAST in that specific example was rather limited, but um, he was able to determine, and uh, CAST did provide a systematic and standardized way of structuring the analysis of that incident um, that, that could have been beneficial in the past. Next paper, the new era of loads flight testing, AI and real-time envelope expansion testing. This one makes me really excited. So in a typical loads campaign, a finite element uh, model is provided to the flight test team. And typically, due to schedule constraints or budget constraints or whatever reason, oftentimes that model is not or can't be updated uh, until the actual test program is over. So there's real no benefit to having, um, it, there, there's no um, increased fidelity in that model for the flight testers. Now, this is what we're used to, we kind of deal with it, but what this, this test team did um, is they created a, what they call a rapid prediction generator. So using artificial intelligence in the control room they were able to feed real time the data from the loads testing they were doing into that FEM model and get real time feedback. Now this allowed them to not only increase their efficiency, but it kept them safer. They avoided uh, overloading the aircraft, they uh, avoided taking too large of steps in their buildup. Um, it was a really effective, um, really effective program that they ran on this. And the last one I'll touch on here, model-based test engineering, incorporating test into digital engineering transformation. So um, this paper used model-based systems engineering in a test environment, which is really unique. Um, this allowed the system under test to access, access authoritative structural, behavioral, and requirements data and take advantage of the MBSE principles of simplifying complex relationships between the model elements. So um, this paper was, was really interesting. Um, the, it was more of a theoretical, more of a process-driven paper, but what they did find were several um, very effective areas in which to implement MBSE into a flight test environment. Oh boy, systems engineering V. Okay, <laughs> bear with me. Um, <laughs> I have this in here more as a visual, just to give you guys something to think about today. Um, flight test and, and testing happens on, on the right side of the V here, right? That's where it's supposed to be, it makes sense. There's a couple feedback loops, um, but, but that, is where, that is where test happens. But I ask the question, is that where we should bring in flight testers into the program? And I think the answer is no. I think flight testers need to be brought into a program on the left side of the V, towards the top, um, in the requirements phase. And uh, the reason for that is the, the flight testers are used to pushing the envelope. Not only are we out there to define the envelope, but we have to define that envelope by going past it. 
and bringing in that operational experience, um, that, is good, that is very valuable to a program in the requirements phase, during the development phase. Um, it could help avoid redesigns, rework late in the game. And in addition to that, flight testers can then help uh, expedite flight testing because now they have a more intimate understanding of the program and they can actually start formulating that plan for flight tests and safety and effectiveness a lot earlier um, in the program. Additionally, more and more we are seeing deployed assets being treated also as test assets, meaning they're constantly feeding data back to the mothership. We see that a lot with the, uh, with the modern day technologies, iPhones, Tesla. Um, and, and so having testers in on that requirements phase, we can identify, okay, well, what data is really important? Um, you know, that, that, that saying, you know, bad data in, bad results out. Well, if we can identify what that good data is early on, that can help speed up the process as well. Ironbirds sometimes are being skipped in uh, development programs, uh, whether it's cost or schedule, that's the reality that we're looking at right now. More emphasis is being placed on modeling and simulation. We now have the technology um, to, to process the big data that comes out of these amazing models and sims. And so that makes it even more important for flight testers to be involved um, so that the risk can be managed and the hazards that come out of programmatic decisions can be identified early on. Okay, enough of the systems engineering V. Uh, this is a great picture. Taylor, I put this in for you. This is out the window of a Gulfstream. Um, I could recognize that window shape anywhere. And I love this quote from Amelia Earhart. Preparation, I have often said, is rightly two thirds of any venture. I have to hit you with some harsh reality. Flight test is really cool, but when you're on an actual aircraft acquisition program, everybody but flight testers hate flight test. It's expensive, it's a huge schedule risk, and what I hope I've been able to do here today is um, share with you and illustrate how flight testers bring value to a program. Um, and I also want to, to highlight here, in our industry, we constantly want to make sure that we are staying on top of uh, the latest technology and tools that are out there. Uh, not only is efficiency very important to us, but safety is always our number one concern. Okay, what a way to start your day. I got to talk about the Society of Flight Test Engineers, show you a cool airplane video. We even talked a little bit about a systems engineering V. Um, Collaboration is what has made SFTE so successful in its first 50 years. And collaboration is the only way that we are going to maintain that success in the next 50 years. So, um, you know, continuing our partnership with AIAA, continuing our partnership with other flight test societies out there, um, bringing in companies, and most importantly, bringing in the people, bringing in more flight testers. So my homework for you all is to, if you aren't already, make friends with a flight tester um, or become one. There are many more resources out there now than when I was a young flight test engineer on uh, receiving education on how to become a flight test. There's long courses, short courses. There are civilian organizations out there that are providing training for this. Um, come to an SFTE symposium. I'd love to see you in Seattle in October. Um, I think to, to, to summarize my talk this morning, I just want to say that this is an amazing time to be in the aerospace industry, and I am just thrilled to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. All right. So it's question time, but the first thing I do want to note is that one of the things that makes a flight tester a flight tester is flight test orange. Jen is wearing a bright orange bracelet. <laughs> I have bright orange on mine as well, so it seems like we followed the rule pretty well today. Absolutely, you have to represent. <laughs> so we have uh, questions online. Um, I will say there are a lot of really good questions. There's no way we're getting to all of them today. But we have some really great panels uh, later in the day too, so it's a really great place to ask those questions you might not have gotten to. Um, I think the first one that is really important to kind of clear the air. Depending on the person, flight test is seen as both a glorified career and also a very non-technical career. 
So can you comment on that stereotype? Absolutely. Um, flight test, yes, I agree, is notoriously a, a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, as flight testers, we really need to understand the whole system. Um, and, and nowadays, with the complexity of the technologies that are coming through and the speed at which we need to go through flight test programs or, or regulatory certification programs, um, we're now a mile wide and it feels like a mile deep. Um, the, the systems interactions um, really need to be understood by the flight tester. Um, I, 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 can, I could totally understand where that sentiment comes from. Um, you know, there is a little bit of a swagger that comes with a flight test engineer. Um, but, but I would say as human beings, you know, flight test engineers are wholly approachable and, and friendly people. Um, and uh, and from, as, from the technical side, you know, um, some of, the, some of the smartest people I've met and technically savvy people I've met have also been flight test engineers. So a career in flight test uh, might suit you if you're also really good at herding cats. I feel like that's, that's a large <laughs> portion of our job as well, um, is managing all of the other folks alongside our technical yes, jobs. That is a really good point. Um, yeah, ma managing the other groups. Um, th flight test is where everybody meets. It's like a big party. We all, we all get together and, and do cool things with airplanes. So you mentioned certification. Um, the top question here, uh, very well liked by everyone. How do you think the role of flight testing is changing with the drive for the increased use of certification by analysis? How do I think the world of flight tests is changing? Um, I, I certainly think that it is, um, it's a welcome change. Um, it is, it is the, the, the differences in certification now are causing uh, flight test programs to, um, I hate to say get creative, but, but um, that, that technical depth, that technical savviness, it, it's just become even more important. Um, and, and going back to that systems engineering V, again, um, you know, there has to be a cultural shift in our acquisition and development programs to bring flight testers in earlier. Um, because that, that type of certification now requires that, that long thought process, that, that commonality amongst all of the departments and the processes. All right. With a lot of focus for SciTech, mostly being R&D and kind of basic level research, how do we make sure that the developments and the research here are actually testable in the real world? Make friends with a flight tester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's, um, that's, I think that's one of the great things about um, our symposium and the papers that we encourage. You know, we, we don't have to bring solutions to, the, to our papers at our symposium, or we don't have to bring solutions to the discussion. Um, it is perfectly okay to bring the questions um, and, and unknowns into that discussion. Um, and... Um, yeah, just, uh, again, I, I, <laughs> that systems engineering V, um, again, br bringing those flight testers in earlier, um, that is what's going to make sure that, that the technologies and the tools um, are actually viable on an aircraft side. So from your career, you've kind of touched uh, a lot of the different portions and the sub-regimes sub of flight test. So what differences do you see across military, commercial, and private jet transport flight tests? differences. That's a really tough one, differences, because there are, like, you would think that all of those different areas of flight tests would, would be different, but really um, there's more similarities than there are differences. Um, the culture is very safety oriented. The culture is very, um, you know, there's a high level of camaraderie on, a, on every flight test team that I've been on. Um, and and the, the emphasis on, um, you know, the, the no vote, right, that is so important in flight tests, uh, that, that is common through, through every single organization that I've been with. Um, and and those, like, those fundamentals of flight tests that I was talking about, again, common through all of the organizations I've been through. Let me think about that one a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> we can come back to yeah. it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so here may be a shameless plug um, from someone in the audience. Can you talk about how SFTE works with SETP? 
Yeah, we are uh, very close organizations. Um, SFT and SCTP, we go to many of the same functions. Um, like I said, like I mentioned, the Flight Test Safety Committee is a big joint venture of ours. Um, many members of SETP are also members of SFTE. Uh, we host local symposium together. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really great relationship that we have with that society. So definitely space for all three here, I think. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I guess I'll ask a question, kind of pulling you back a little bit. What was one of the coolest things that you got to do really early on in your career that you kind of look back on and say, wow, that was way cooler than I thought it was when I was in the middle of it? Yeah. Um, I would have to say uh, early on in my career, I was a, I was a young flight test engineer uh, when I got put uh, in a lead position um, for, for the flight director coupled mode system on the V-22 Osprey. Um, huge, huge system. There's 12 modes for the Marine Corps variant, there's 13 modes for the uh, Air Force variant, um, and, and it was just a huge test plan, and, and I was suddenly put in this position of, of managing this entire test program. And due to scheduling constraints um, and the nature of my test, testing, um, I actually took my test testing on the road. So I actually had to utilize an outside squadron. Um, at the time, they were called VMX-22. They're VMX-1 now. But they were based out of New River, North Carolina. And so and they were, they were an operational test squadron. So they were still a test squadron, um, just slightly different. Um, but it was, uh, it was the Genu Cheetah show. I loaded up my car with this giant computer that plugged into the V-22 and my dog and all my flight equipment. And, um, and it, it, it felt like a really hard thing to do at the time, but I look back at it now and I'm like, that was, that was pretty darn cool that I got to do that. <laughs> so maybe a quick primer for the audience, since not everyone here is used to flight test, can you just super quickly cover the difference between operational test OT and developmental test DT? Yeah, so operate, uh, excuse me, developmental test, we're testing to the requirements. So the, um, they, someone builds an airplane and they say, hey, did, did we build um, what we were supposed to, what we said we were gonna build? Um, operational test is to um, make sure that, that what was built is actually serving the purpose, serving the mission. Um, that's what it all comes down to. That's actually one of the reasons why uh, NAVAIR, the Navy Marine Corps in particular, sends civilian flight test engineers through test pilot school. It's to teach us um, how to translate mission, the mission application, pilot, you know, what the pilots need out of an aircraft back through flight test and engineering. Um, and so, off to, sorry, I went off topic there, but yeah, OT is more like, can this do the mission that we need it to do? Great. So I see your top question. I promise I'm not ignoring it. I'm saving it for the end. So whoever sees all of the votes on the top, I'll get there, I promise. Okay, so another one. Are flight test engineers suffering from the same labor availability shortages that we're seeing among a lot of pilots and other engineers and kind of what's on the horizon? How do we fix that? Yes, absolutely we are. Um, especially with all of the new startups that are popping up, um, all of this new innovation, that's really exciting for a flight tester. And so, um, yeah, we, we're, we're being spread really thin now across the industry. Um, I think if you look on any job search page, you'll see um, a, a, a lot of openings for flight test engineering, both uh, entry level and senior, senior level. Um, how do we address that? Make friends with a flight tester uh, <laughs> or become one. Um, I, I think that the, um, the, the engineering design and analysis aspect, um, you know, the, there could be trained flight testers that take their system and their aircraft through the entire process. Um, but that training is vital and the understanding of the fundamentals of flight tests, that's vital to make sure that that is a successful single thread that can take a program all the way through to whatever its end goal is. I think maybe too a problem that's not a problem is the nature of flight test. You get really good at presenting to the customer and presenting to people and also being very technical. And if you look in all of your organizations, I would bet that a large portion of your leadership are past flight test. So maybe we get poached a little early as well because some of you just make really great management, really great leadership. I see my senior director in the audience and he's an ex-fighter pilot. And so I think that's kind of a common thread that it, we make great leaders later in our careers. And so 
maybe that's part of our yeah, shortage as well. Absolutely, I think that's a really great point to make. You know, um, uh, flight test engineers, we're trained to be assertive. Um, there's no ranks in the flight deck. Um, anybody can speak up, like going back to that no vote that I had mentioned earlier, if, if a flight tester, anybody on the flight test team sees something wrong or a potential hazard, everybody has the right to raise their hand and say, I think there's something wrong, we need to pause and, and look at this. Um, and I think that assertiveness and the ability to, to have that voice absolutely leads into that. So this is a little bit of teaser for one of our panels later today, uh, but can you talk to the degree of digital environment and MBSE and digital twins and those sorts of new capabilities and how that's accelerating our flight test mission? So it's, it's still really early for us um, from, from an MBSE standpoint. Um, you know, I, I know that there are a lot of flight test organizations out there that are taking a really good hard look at implementing MBSC and other, other types of, um, you know, uh, the, the digital twin um, aspects into their programs. Um, right now, we're really still, I think, in case study and, and some of the papers that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, really show a huge benefit to a flight test program. The thing with, pro with, with uh, processes and, and um, systems like that is it really takes a commitment um, from the organization in and of itself. And it can be expensive and it can be time consuming to implement. So really committing to that implementation, um, I, I think is what is gonna be key to bringing that into our industry as well. I think this one kind of dovetails it really nicely. Um, how ready are we as a flight test community to manage airworthiness processes and new processes for autonomous systems and all of the new things coming down the line? Oh, as flight testers, are we ready? I think as flight testers, like, yeah, I think we're ready for it. <laughs> I think so. Um, the thing is, like I, like I was talking about earlier, flight test is where everybody meets, right? So, so not only do we need to be ready, but everybody else needs to be ready too. And, and, and making sure that those conversations are happening and, and that the steps to implementation are there and again, committed to, um, that, that, that's gonna be what holds us up. This one goes pretty well um, to, do you think there are any big differences that flight test engineers kind of need to think about or need to plan for um, to make sure that they still have all of the command and control that they want for when they're testing uncrewed aircraft? Is there any differences between flight testing crewed and uncrewed? I don't think so. Um, and, and it goes back to the fundamentals of flight tests. Um, the crewed and uncrewed teams that I have seen and worked with, um, we all have basically the same training. Um, the, the UAV pilots that go through Navy test pilot school, it's the same curriculum. Um, it's the same fundamentals that get driven into them. Um, and uh, the, the teams that I have seen all implement the same level of safety and um, efficiency that I've seen in, in crewed aircraft as well. So we're almost out of time, so I'll circle back. We've had a little bit. Um, any differences between military, commercial, private jet, um, oh. in those areas? <laughs> You're not getting out of it. I know, I'm not getting out of that. Okay, I didn't really, uh, I, I wasn't really able to think about that. Okay, differences. Um, I guess maybe one is, is the way we do with the airworthiness process from yes. the military to commercial is. Yeah a little bit different and, and you'll definitely trip up if you try to treat them the same. Yes, that is a really great point. Thank you for that help. <laughs> um, yeah, the airworthiness process absolutely is different. Um, you know, I, I think um, the end goal obviously is, is the same to, to deploy a, an airworthy vehicle. Um, but yeah, there are different entities and agencies that all have their subtle nuances and, and not so subtle nuances in, in how to deal with them. Um, yeah, that's a really good one. All right. So we'll wrap up with the one that everyone here has apparently been waiting for. So flight test pilots and engineers apparently always have the best stories. Um, so we'll talk a lot about the stories later today. So kind of hold on for those. But do you have a, a little teaser of a flight test story to share to wrap up the morning? Oh, my gosh. Um, sure. So I, I get airsick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing, it's G-induced. So like, like I can go up and kind of twirl around or whatever and I'm fine, but the minute that we go to do any high G work, 
you do what's called a G-warm to get your body warmed up for the Gs that are about to, to so, you, so if your target is like say nine Gs, you would start at three and then go to five and then bu and build up to that. So, um, so yeah, here, a little teaser for today is um, yeah, I would go out on these sorties and would throw up on the three G point and then would just be totally fine the rest of the, the rest of the flight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you have never seen a video of someone going through G training, there are many of them readily available on YouTube. A lot of our Air Force test pilots that go through some of the Sandy Fuse training, the faces that they make as they get to uh, <laughs> 7 Gs and 9 Gs is absolutely hilarious. Um, so if you need a giggle throughout your day, definitely check out yes, one of those absolutely. videos. There's something called lobster eyes. It's when you're throwing up and you're trying to look for the ICS switch to turn it off so the <laughs> other person doesn't hear you. <laughs> All right, so that's the time that we have for this morning. Um, I'd like to thank you again, Jen. I learned so much in such a short time. I'm, again, so inspired for flight tests in the future. And thank you for sharing your message and your stories. So in appreciation of your participation, I have the most coveted in all of flight tests, the challenge coins, the flight test swag. You can ask any flight tester. They have a whole collection, and they can tell you all about their favorite. So we'd like to present you with this coin, and thank you so much. Thank you, Taylor. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you to our audience today. We'll be continuing our conversation in today's Forum 360 sessions. At 10 a.m., we're going to have a panel on how will AI minimize safety risk. At 3.30, we'll have another session on using digital tools to revolutionize test. So if you liked a couple of those answers, come back later. We have some really incredible people to talk. And my shameless plug, today at 12.30, our Rising Leaders lunch panel. We have Jen, we have Mike Rabins, and Steve Frick, and they will all be telling us stories from the sky. The one thing I do ask you is that because this is a rising leader's lunch, if you are not a young professional anymore, and if you're young at heart, that does not count, please allow the young professionals to get their free lunch. You can probably afford to get a lunch elsewhere, but please join us for the panels themselves. That is at 1230 today, and we're so excited to see you in the ballroom later. Have a great day at SciTech.